Hi, this is my review of the Defiant role-playing game. This is a role-playing game a bit more focused on storytelling and character development. It's more strategic rather than tactical. This is a role-playing game where supernatural aristocrats or nobles rule and protect humanity. They keep them safe from the forces of the apocalypse. You will be able to play as angelic beings, as demonic beings, as draconic beings, and as godlike beings. Now, let's talk about the quality of the PDF. When you purchase the Defiant role-playing game, you get several files. You have the complete rulebook, of course, with bookmarks, and I will talk more about its quality in a few minutes. You also have a character sheet for each of the different types of characters that you can create. You also have a brochure for a district in which you are going to be playing. You get character creation cards. And some of these cards directly tie your characters to the district that you're going to be using as a setting. We will talk about districts later on in this review. You also get a game master guide, the player guide, the character creation guide as well. Each of these files uh, comes in an electronic version and a print version. That is, if you want to look at it or view it from your smartphone or your tablet or computer, or you want to print it, you have different formats for your preference. These guides are basically handy sheets between uh, four, four pages if you are using them in your device or just two pages if you are using them as uh, printed sheets that will have a summary of all of the rules and the important information to play the Defiant role-playing game. Now, this core rulebook is about 604 pages long, but the interesting thing is that the system is quite simple to understand. The complexity and depth lies in the setting and the way in which you are going to be creating stories in this world that is very surreal but at the same time feels all too real in some aspects when it comes to the uh, romantic, social and antagonistic relationships between the player characters and the non-player characters. You have combat, you have intrigue, you have adventure, you have seduction, you have alliances and threats all in a single package. Now let's talk about the quality and the aesthetics of these files. Everything about the Defiant is quite elegant and sophisticated. Just taking a look at the cover, you see this beautiful but supernatural looking woman. She looks quite seductive but at the same time very classy and dangerous. And that's the world of Defiant in a nutshell. The entire art is expressed in these tones of fuchsia, uh, pink tones, some lighter colors and some powerful uh, purples and dark blues tossed in here and there with, with some uh, mysterious looking tones of purple overall. So the graphic design, the aspect of the illustrations is pretty much perfect. Everything is well written and explained. The font is perfect. This is one of those books that are very easy on the eyes. You will be reading through all of the pages and it will feel as if you are just reading five or six pages and you have actually read like 20 pages. So it's very easy to go through the entire rulebook and to play the game, you do not need to read through all of it. It actually contains tips and advice on how to read the uh, necessary information to get started right away. And the core rulebook is completely hyperlinked and bookmarked. So it's going to be very easy for you to navigate the entire PDF. The organization is perfect and I couldn't spot, I only spotted a single typo. It was something like reap the rewards, you know, like reaping, like harvest related, but it read like rip as in ripping a sheet of paper, for example. So I think that's a mistake, but that's the only error that I found in this 604 pages long document. So that's pretty amazing. Overall, the quality is superb. One of the highest quality documents that I have read in several years. Now, let's talk about the contents of the Defiant Core Rulebook. The book starts with an introduction to what this game is all about. 
This is about modern day supernatural blue bloods, aristocrats, nobles that are ruling over their subjects. Their subjects are normal humans. And how this came to be is a very interesting sequence of events. The forces of the apocalypse decided that humanity was no longer necessary. The entire planet and its inhabitants were going to be destroyed. So the defiant come from different sides of this conflict. For example, the angelic defiant were part of these apocalyptic forces, but they decided to defy their orders. They decided to protect humanity, to encase different cities on Earth with these force fields known as the Sephiroth. The Sephiroth need to be kept up and running, fueled by passion. Other forces of the Defiant also came from the side of the Apocalypse, like for example the Leviathans. They are the destructive dragons that were supposed to destroy the planet, but some of them went against the rules. They didn't want to be just forces of destruction. They wanted something more, to be hungry not only for chaos, but also for life as humans know it. Then we have the Deva. These are forgotten gods of humanity. They used to be very powerful in the past, but as time went by, their fates, their lore, simply faded away. But with this new rise of apocalyptic forces, they once again became empowered by pure magic, and they want to gain new followers. And those that remain faithful to them, they also want to welcome them into their group. So the Deva also protect humanity alongside with the other Defiant. And then we have the Infernals. Demonic Defiant were once humans that sinned so, so low, so horribly, that they were trapped in a sublevel of hell. But these demons decided to break out of their prison and to become good or at least try to become decent in their understanding so they went on the side of the defiant that is of the angels of the leviathans of the deva and of course they went on the side of humanity they want to protect humanity because they want to experience what life is all about as humans know it so all of these different uh, bloodlines of supernatural and divine beings want to experience the passion, the joy of living, as uh, humanity experiences it every day. And with their passion and the passion that they create by ruling humanity, they keep these force fields, the Sephiroth, up. The Sephiroth are the only thing, the only shield that keep all of these different cities safe from the forces of the apocalypse. So this is what Defiant is all about. And we will go deeper into how gameplay proceeds later on. They give you a chapter breakdown, telling you about the world of the Defiant, how to prepare the, for the game, how to run the game. They also tell you how to proceed. For example, if you are introducing first-time role players, they tell you how to present the game to them. This is actually a very simple system. It's quite focused on storytelling. The rules are very easy to understand and the complexity rather lies in creating your character and developing that character while you play, while you participate in this fictional modern world of apocalyptic conflict. They tell you all of the definitions concerning game master, the players. So this is a great role playing game for someone who is just starting to play role playing games, especially those that are focused more on storytelling and character development. They tell you what you need to play this game, of course. You only need the um, cards. You could replace the cards. They are not necessary. They are just there. So they serve as a handy reference when you're creating your character. And as you are adventuring into the district that you are using as a campaign setting, you also need a set of dice. Focusing on the bare minimum, you only need a six-sided die, an eight-sided die, and a ten-sided die. But it's much better to have a full set, which would be three six-sided dice, four eight-sided and four ten-sided dice. That's the way 
in which the game can run quite smoothly if everyone has uh, his or her own set of dice. You also have the game mates like character sheets and the cards that I mentioned, also the line and veil cards, and I will talk about those later on. So all of the basic concepts are laid out quite clearly, and although this game has a standard or traditional set of roles when it comes to playing as a player character or as a game master, the players actually have a lot of agency or authorship in this role-playing game. The game master, of course, will coordinate things, will present different challenges, but the player characters are going to be playing as nobles. They are ladies and lords of their domains. So oftentimes they're going to be mandating or dictating what is going to happen in their daily lives. They are giving the orders, they are calling the shots. So the game master needs to make sense of the tales that they are spinning and present the different non-player characters. This role-playing game is well suited for a troupe style of game where part of the scene focuses on one of the player characters and the rest of the players can participate as non-player characters in that scene. Now, the theme of the game is quite easy to define but complex like I told you when it comes to the relationships and developments. It's basically an urban fantasy game featuring blue-blooded supernaturals handling all sorts of situations, mundane and those that are beyond the mundane, experiencing the pleasures of flesh and mind, and there are many things that you will get to do. You will rule or preside over your court, you will fight others in contests, you will fight the forces of the apocalypse, you will uncover all sorts of secrets. Sometimes you need to uphold the rules of the domain and follow those rules yourself, even if they are quite extreme and sometimes nonsensical. You can also plot against your rivals, you can build and cultivate all sorts of relationships, and this game is actually well suited for a competitive experience. If you wanted to have a campaign where the player characters are all moving against each other, trying to get the upper hand, you can also play it like that, although it's a good idea, at least in the first sessions, to play it on the same side, to have all of the player characters play nicely with each other as they try to unravel and navigate the complexities of the world of Defiant. This is a story about your characters. The way in which you divide the different adventures and campaigns is based around episodes. It feels a lot like a TV series with a group of episodes becoming part of a season. And all of these seasons will form chronicles. So the book tells you about the episode structure. You even have a pilot episode to introduce everyone. Each episode consists of two main threads, events that take place in the defiant world that your characters cannot ignore. These threads could be broad events with plenty of time to delve into your character's goals. You make new friends and enemies and so forth. There are many sub-threads between these larger threads but you do have a story arc to make sense of things. It's just that you have so many choices. If you are a player, there are many ways in which you can develop your character's life in each episode. They tell you about the pilot episode, the first mini episode, to establish things, establishing traits, relationships, backgrounds. And after that, we immediately get the rules breakdown. This is about personal themes. The players choose personal themes for their characters. They are a source of traits that make your heroes better at overcoming odds. So when you are making different checks, your themes could present an advantage and even sometimes a disadvantage in some specific cases. So if your character is a socialite or a guide, this is going to add a sort of bonus to your check. The challenges are basically any way to resolve a situation where failure is of great importance and victory is of utmost importance. It is a test of the character's skills and talents. You also have endeavors. These are long-term goals, major plans that will be resolved across many episodes. They are more sophisticated versions of challenges. You could think of them as extended challenges that take several episodes to flourish or to crash down. You have more information on traits, how they represent your character's abilities, areas of expertise and talents. 
Maybe you have an incredible voice. Or maybe you have friends in high places. Whenever a trait seems appropriate, you can use it in a challenge to increase your potential. Now, do not confuse them with personal themes. Personal themes are a source of traits. These make your characters better at overcoming odds. They can give you special questions that you can ask anytime to influence the scenery, to get interesting answers from the game master. Personal themes give you a degree of control in every situation, while traits are more direct bonuses. Now, when it comes to potential, when a character is taking a challenge, you need to sum up all applicable traits and subtract all afflictions that would hinder their effort. The number you end up with is the character's potential for this challenge. The higher the potential, the more likely it is the character will succeed. We will talk more about this later on. You also have afflictions. This is whenever something bad happens to your character. They could get an affliction, so maybe you get distracted, you get wounded, your clothes are ruined in a party or, or social gathering, this will work against you if you are trying to accomplish something. So whenever you carry out a challenge, you roll dice. The basic dice you roll during challenges are three six-sided dice, and every point of potential represents an upgrade. So let's say that your character is particularly skilled in battle, and you're having a physical confrontation. One of your lowest-sided die will go up to the next level. So a six-sided die will go to be an eight-sided die. This eight-sided die could become a ten-sided die. So for example, may maybe you are rolling your three six-sided dice. You have a potential of one. That would mean you could upgrade a d6 to a d8, resulting in a pool of d6, d6, and d8. But if you had a lot of potential, an impressive potential of, for example, six, all of your dice would be upgraded to 10-sided dice, giving you a pool of three 10-sided dice. Now when it comes to the outcomes, all die results of five or more count as successes, regardless of the number of sides. So when you roll a d6, only five and six are counted as successes. So that's why it's worth it to get a lot of potential so that you roll a d8 or a d10 and get a higher chance of rolling a five or a six or above. The more successes rolled, the better. One success is a mixed blessing at best, while three successes result in a decisive victory. You also have shards. Each player character has a pool of shards that they can use to improve their chances in a challenge. Spending a shard before the roll adds an additional d8 to the roll, resulting in a four dice pool. And this additional dice is even upgradable, just like the other three. You could also use shards to power up your special rules or ask theme questions. So as you can see, the player characters in this game are very powerful. You start out being a divine or supernatural being of great resources and personal power. You rarely raise your abilities, at least when it comes to raw capacity. But as you gain allies and other sorts of resources, that's the way you become a more powerful character in the world of Defiant. It's about hierarchy, social standing, and gaining the favor of these force fields known as the Sephiroth. Next, we have information on the line and the veil. This feature, I think, is partly necessary and partly unnecessary. I will try to explain why in a few minutes. First, let's talk about the feature itself. This is basically a system or a subsystem of cards one card represents a line, or has a line on it. The other one has a dotted line. The line represents the line, obviously, and the dotted line re represents the veil. So, in the role-playing game of Defiant, you could encounter some situations that could be too charged when it comes to being quite violent or quite sexual. There could be all sorts of uncomfortable situations so these cards are used to either ban those situations or make them a bit less descriptive a bit less explicit so for example let's say that you are in a very violent fight against an agent of the apocalypse maybe your character describes something like oh well i, I take the the enemy by the jaw and i rip 
the enemy is just just like that spraying blood all over and and someone could feel like like that's a bit too much and that person would tap the line card and then that person would have to explain uh, why uh, he or she doesn't feel too comfortable with that situation you don't need to give all of the details but you do need to give some reasons as to why you want to ban that from all of the rest of the episodes and even chronicles now when it comes to the veil this is basically a way to make it a bit less like i told you less explicit lower the tone a bit so maybe you you do want to have some violent conflicts or battles but you're not comfortable describing all of the bloody details so maybe when someone describes something like that like i told you maybe somebody is ripping out the uh, organs of someone else and you want to just have like a description like and my character violently kills that enemy or something you tap the veil line uh, the veil card sorry and you describe uh, why you want to lessen that impact so maybe now there won't be too many details now you will just say something like and my character uh, destroys that enemy or rips apart that enemy but does, you do not include further description or details now I say that this is partly necessary because when it comes to the world and setting of the Fiant you will have those situations that could be a bit too violent a bit too sexual or maybe both things at the same time if your group is mature and um, just emotionally mature and you are looking for that sort of experience I think you should go ahead and, and enjoy the game like that but some people could think that it's a bit too much however what I think is unnecessary is the system of cards itself why do you need to keep tapping a line card or a bell card when you could just simply say you know what guys I feel a bit too uncomfortable with those uh, graphic descriptions or you could also say something like that uh, brings me uh, a lot of bad memories I would like to ban those situations from the Chronicles and that's why you have a session zero or even the pilot episode in this case if you want to play it like that to set the tone for the campaign and make things clear about what you want so like I said you don't need to tap a card you just need to communicate with your players you're going to have to state your concerns either way so I think this system of line and veil maybe it works for some but for me it's a bit unnecessary you could clarify things while talking after that you have information on the defiant inspirations so this game takes inspiration from existing systems and fiction a lot of you could probably think already of some systems and uh, fictional elements particularly vampire the masquerade instead of vampires you have these supernatural beings the defiant although it's a very different situation it does share some similarities but the defiant feel a bit well actually a lot more powerful of course they are deities they are angels they are demons they are primeval dragons and it also takes some inspiration from others from role-playing game systems such as fate so here you have all of the sources listed you have books like for example American Gods you have movies like Underworld or Constantine you have series such as True Blood or Shadow Hunters, comic books such as Sandman you have role-playing games listed as well of course with the world of darkness like I mentioned Vampire the Masquerade all of that you have Fate, Houses of the Blooded, Apocalypse World, Iron Sworn all sorts of role-playing games and sources of fiction next we have a chapter featuring the world of defiant itself it is a world like ours but it is doomed to be destroyed the only thing that keeps the apocalyptic forces at bay are the defiant and the sephiroth that serve as divine barriers so you have information on the defiant domains so the only way the defiant could survive the ongoing slaughter of the apocalypse because they have decided to switch sides was through the use of the powerful apocalyptic seals known as the Sephiroth so they created many safe havens mostly within cities harboring hundreds of defiant and many more humans the main concept for defiant is apocalypse the agents of the apocalypse 
are constantly trying to destroy cities. They will try to assault them directly, but these enemies also attempt to infiltrate the cities, uh, cause division and take down the Defiant in more subtle ways, through humans or through treacherous or corrupted members of the Defiant. The whole society is built around the principles and commandments. These are rules and principles that regulate the life of Defiant and consequently of humans. So the Sephiroth's requirements must be met. It is fueled by passion. This force field is empowered by the everyday lives of humans and Defiant. For humans, the commandments may seem weird, cruel, perverse, bothersome, but for the Defiant, it's just how things are. It's the only way to keep those shields, those barriers up. So this is going to be a big part of each episode, each session. Sometimes the Sephiroth, through their different representatives, are going to be asking many difficult and strange things of Defiant and humans, and they must follow these rules. Humans are not aware of this apocalyptic conflict, we will talk about that later on, but the Defiant are completely aware of what is going on and they want to keep the Sephira going by fulfilling the Sephira's rules, the commandments, because the Sephira also empowers those that benefit it, so it's a sort of mutual relation or uh, a feedback between the Defiant and the Sephiroth. You have information on societies, how the domains are the lonely bastions of light. In the otherwise apocalypse-ridden world, each domain exists without any communication with other Defiant societies, and it's basically a world of its own. There are no global politics, no cross-domain alliances. The city is the whole world for those that live within that specific city. There's information on the size of a domain. They differ significantly between one another. There is no such thing as an average domain. The courts themselves also differ in size, ranging from a handful to over a dozen courtiers. Every province is home to between half a dozen and two dozen courts, each governed by a lord or a lady. Then we have information on the origins of the Defiant. Like I mentioned at the beginning, they come from four different groups of supernatural creatures. They live together and cooperate in order to maintain the domains. The angels are the rebels from the apocalyptic hosts. They don't want to serve the apocalypse. They want to take matters into their own hands. We have the Deva that have lived in this world for thousands of years. They were worshipped as deities and some of them are actually deeply in love with humanity, while others are just hungry to be worshipped as idols. You also have the Leviathans, awakened from their long sleep to be used as the great beasts of war, but the Defiant Leviathans crave more than just destruction. They join the ranks of the Defiant to experience life in other ways. Then we have the Infernals, they are the denizens of the underworld, they escaped their inhospitable home, to start a new life amongst the other Defiant and the humans. When it comes to the Defiant Angels, also known as the Fallen, the Divine, the Angels are the manifestation of the Absolute's thoughts and will. They were the ultimate soldiers, the perfect agents, the unstoppable weapons. Since their work was to be done in the mortal world, their masters gave them human forms. Angels have never experienced sensuality before, or so they say. So for most, this was a traumatic experience. For some, however, this new situation feels less like torture and more like an eye-opening experience. So the war started with the angels reveling against the forces of the apocalypse, reveling in all sorts of ways. They defied the forces of the apocalypse, but they also indulged in the pleasures of human experience. When the spark of the rebellion was slowly fading, angels received the help from the Deva and later on from the demonic infernals. Now, while angels have humanoid forms, they could appear somewhat monstrous, majestic, but quite frightening. But they choose to appear human because they find the shape quite beautiful and harmonic, but they look a bit too perfect, too harmonic, too beautiful even by human standards. 
What really gives them away are their eyes that seem to almost burn with intense colors. Next we have information on the defiant Deva, the worshipped, the dethroned. Some say Deva were sentenced to live on earth as a punishment. Others see them as spirit protectors of this world, the embodiment of human prayers. They emerged around the time of the first civilizations and have accompanied humanity since. Their offspring had no recollection of the glorious past, nor any supernatural powers, but unknowingly carried the legacy onward. The Deva appeared to have been forgotten a short while ago, but when the conflict with the apocalypse happened, they were once again infused by the magical elements or energies surrounding the conflict and the prayers of their faithful. It quickly became clear they had a role to play in the upcoming apocalypse. For many, the temptation of becoming true gods was so great that they agreed to lead their followers to slaughter. However, some work tirelessly to save the world from destruction and protect the humans, of course. Every deva has a spiritual connection with an animal type, and this usually shows in their appearance different marks or signs on their bodies that tie them to specific animals such as teeth, scales, feathers, all sorts of animalistic traits. Then we have information on the defiant leviathans, the bound, the hungry. Long before the rise of humanity, earth belonged to the mighty leviathans. Theirs was not a rule of soft words and mercy, but of fire and blood. The weak were called to satisfy the hunger of the strong. They knew only death and destruction. Yet the world was changing. When the time came, when the forces of the apocalypse were unleashed, the great beasts awoke in their larvae human forms, and to their surprise, some hungered for more than mere destruction, so they rebelled against the forces of the apocalypse as well. They allied themselves with the Deva, with the angels and the infernals. While they may have sacrificed their impressive draconic forms, their powers remain formidable. Although they look human, there is always something unfamiliar some malicious thing about them. It reveals the ancient predatory beasts within them. They do not hide their horns. They do not hide their strength. They have all sorts of shapes, colors, and sizes. And while to humans they could appear completely normal, to the defiant they look like majestic creatures. Next we have information on the defiant infernal, the demonic, the escaped, they are the citizens of Shadmag and Gomorrah. They built their twin cities in the pinnacle of the golden age of humanity, long before the rise of ancient civilizations. They stood as a testament to human ingenuity and might, although throughout the ages they degenerated. The greatest minds and the foulest souls filled the city's streets, creating a one-of-a-kind society of ambition and insatiable decadence. In the greater scheme of things, however, they were punished for their transgression and were sent to a prison of unimaginable tortures. This is the concept of human hell. And then came the apocalypse. The once impenetrable defenses of hell malfunctioned, allowing some of the creatures to escape back into the mortal realm. So these newly escaped infernals, in a search for redemption and in a search for pleasure, they decided to join the defiant and protect humanity. Of all of the origins, it's probably the infernals who resemble humans the most. However, when they are hurt or feel strong emotions, they manifest scars, tattoo-like ritualistic symbols, terrible stigmata and infernal auras. After all of that, we have information on the rebirth. In order to enter the safety of the domain and live among other defiant, one must entirely renounce their apocalyptic heritage. Their battle-scarred vessels are left behind along with the war-torn memories, and the Defiant are reborn in new mortal bodies. Although they still possess their power and those supernatural or divine-looking features that I mentioned, the Defiant are reborn in new mortal bodies, and when they reach adolescence, they mystically awaken, gaining supernatural powers and becoming aware of who they are. The newly awakened Defiant are instinctively drawn to their spiritual parents in the domain. You have information on the forces of the Apocalypse, because outside of the Defiant Domains, the Apocalypse rages on, 
Whole cities are burned down, people are slain by thousands, there's suffering, chaos, and death. Only the defiant protected cities remain safe. You have details on the safety of the domain. The apocalypse is held at bay by the Sephiroth, with a handful of agents of the apocalypse lurking in the shadows trying to corrupt mortals or weak defiant, the cities are never safe. To keep humanity unaware of the horrors without, the carnival has been established. This is the work of the apocalyptic Deva. They sustain this powerful spell known as the carnival. It makes most mortals oblivious to the destruction around them. They are easier to protect but easier to control as well. The spell works on the mundanes of the defiant cities. They carry out their daily lives and whenever they try to go beyond the cities or engage in some activity that goes against the plan of the Defiant, many loops, many modifications of their reality in a Truman Show sort of way happen to keep them ignorant of what is going on. You have details on the world outside. On the verge of the domains, the world starts to crumble. As two different realities collide with each other, Defiant call those borders the outskirts. They are deadly places. It is seemingly impossible to survive there because the forces of the apocalypse are rampaging in those areas. Further behind those chaotic borders, there are great beasts tearing whole cities apart with ease, holy fires cleansing the land, and grim armies scouring the battlefields. It is thanks to the carnival that the minds of the mortals are kept safe, for the most part. Although some mortals actually manage to see beyond this veil. Often the torment is so great that the only way for the mortals to stay indifferent is to forget about the issue altogether. This is why the carnival was raised. The Defiant do not know much about the current state of things outside the domains, and even if they manage to wander outside the city and pass the outskirts, they lose all memory and forget who they are, which usually means they cannot find their way back to safety. They are now prey to the forces of the apocalypse. Next, we have information on the horsemen. The supernatural creatures that serve the apocalypse are called the horsemen. They are the strongest of them, infused with incredible powers. They are a threat that Defiant cannot stand against outside their domains. However, even if they manage to enter the Defiant cities, the power of Sephira weakens them significantly. Thankfully, such incursions are extremely rare and virtually unheard of in cities that genuinely try to heed the Sephira's needs and adhere to the laws set by the Hierophant, which could be considered the voice of the Sephira, the representative of the Sephira on the part of Defiant. Now, there are different categories of horsemen, of course. You have the horsemen of war. These are mighty behemoths, the true beasts of the apocalypse. They are grim reminders of the fate that all Leviathans were originally to share. In Defiant Cities, it's far more common to stumble upon rivers. Some believe that these creatures were created specifically to enter the domains. At first glance, they could easily pass for ordinary mortals going about their mundane lives. So these types of horsemen of war, the rivers, they are still quite violent. They are focused on raw destruction but they enter the cities and they immediately start to wreak havoc. They have overgrown muscles, extra limbs, razor-sharp claws, etc. They are deadly for normal humans, but a single river doesn't stand a chance against the Defiant. Unfortunately, they attack in groups to gain the advantage. Then we have the Horsemen of Famine. Not every horseman attacks their targets directly. Banes, as they are known, are terrifying creatures that can starve out entire cities if they manage to breach the Sephira's defenses. Their apocalyptic energy slowly counters the efforts of the Sephira, depriving whole districts of food and drinkable water, leaving only pain and suffering. Unfortunately, the dreaded are far more likely to appear in a city, as they are sometimes able to pass through cracks in the Sephira's defenses. These are creatures of angelic origin. They try to kidnap a defiant and then work on them in their hideouts within the city. And through torment, they extract information and try to turn their prey against their own kind. So they are specialists in torture through pain, starvation, and breaking the will of their prey. 
You also have the Horsemen of Pestilence. Due to their nature, these apocalyptic idols are amongst the most notorious horsemen, even in otherwise safe domains. Their initial power is rather modest, enabling them to infiltrate defiant cities, and then their work starts when they find the right group of mortals. They turn them into loyal followers of the apocalypse. They grant them supernatural gifts to seduce them and better carry out their will. Over time, they gain more and more followers. They are those that create cults. So idols use their powers as tools and soldiers. They effectively work as chimeras, bent on turning mortals into agents of chaos. They operate in many places, in clubs, in neighborhoods, perhaps in schools. You also have the horsemen of death. Perhaps not as imposing as other horsemen, the reapers as they are known, are perfect killing machines, always focused on their desired target. They are the assassins of the apocalypse. It is unsure how they pick their prey, but once a reaper manages to enter a domain, they always go after a single opponent and then leave after their deed is done. Even weakened by the Sephira, they are much faster, stronger and more durable than Defiant, making stopping them an almost impossible task. Most of the time, it is only after their target is dead that anyone understands what happened. And death isn't always literal. For the Defiant, their connection with the Sephira might be considered their lifeline. Sometimes, when it fades or weakens, the individual may become susceptible to the apocalyptic machinations and a wraith may begin to hunt them. Wraiths have no physical bodies, so they are harmless to anyone protected by the Sephira but they can influence those whose mystical connection has been severed or damaged. Royalty is safe from their machinations because they are too close to the Sephiroth. The courtiers, however, they rely on their lords and ladies for maintaining their link to the Sephiroth's needs, so if their leaders neglect them, they will be attacked by a wraith. You can see how these horsemen attack in different ways according to their nature. You have the horsemen of war that attack in groups. You have the horsemen of famine that weaken and starve the population. And you have the horsemen of pestilence that create cults and sicken the mind and the bodies of the inhabitants of the city. And then the horsemen of death act as perfect assassins for these scatological forces. You have details on the depraved and corrupted. Unfortunately, the horsemen are not the only threat to the domains. Some among the defiant are willing to turn towards dark powers for their own personal gain or out of spite. Power-hungry courtiers allying themselves with the enemy to take their sovereign's place, depraved lords using the apocalypse to hurt their sworn rivals, and weak-minded lowborn betraying their kind for the promise of true power. The list goes on. Now, when it comes to this rulebook having some sort of beast theory, all of the creatures described before come without any stats. Most lesser horsemen use the same mechanics as other non-player characters. You can create them as any other character in the game and present adequate challenges. We will talk more about the system later on. And when it comes to the stronger apocalyptic entities, you will find some suggestions on how to make them work in story arcs in a section later on in this book, although I won't go into too many details because that is connected to the campaign setting secrets contained in this rulebook. They are actually very rare, and they are not included in full details. 